because I messed it up at the 9 o'clock. So I'm not even going to say it. So just get your text and go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Guys, I tried to tell a joke this morning, and it totally bombed. So just get the, get the videotape, and I, I decided to leave that up to Pastor Joel, that I'm going to stick to my lane. So I'm just going to teach you the word. Amen? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. You can be seated. Spirit of the living God, anoint me to speak as the orator of the most high God. Anoint every ear and open it up that they may hear what thus saith the Lord. I pray that you would bring the heart of the husband to the heart of the wife, the heart of the wife toward the heart of the husband. Restore what the enemy has tried to divide. I pray that you would prepare those of us that are waiting and believing God for our Boaz and for our good thing. And those that have gone through divorce and devastation that you would heal every place they've been wounded and hurt that you would make us whole in the area of relationships I decree it I declare it and therefore it is established well as we continue on this track we've studied so much throughout the month of June and people said Pastor Paula please keep teaching on relationships because we're seeing that it's really helping heal whether you are looking and believing God for your spouse whether you're married no matter what situation you're in I believe that God's work will God's word will always work and so while this is in the context of marriage it's it's not good for man to dwell alone. Alone means separateness. So God had an antidote for you being separated, for aloneness. It's not good that you are alone or to be separated because life is relational. And while some people are in a marriage, others of us are being prepared or some have just come out of a situation, life is relational. So much so that this will impact every area. You'll see how you work with your co-workers, how you have better relationships with your children. Um, everything in life is about the network that you have. The currency of the kingdom is relationships. Nehemiah chapter 3 God takes an entire chapter and he says such and such is next to such and such is next to and the word next literally means has connection because whoever you're connected to whatever you're close and in contact with ultimately will flow through you so that's why they could accomplish in 52 days what had taken the Jews over 90 years to try to do because they had strategic positioning and lineup look at somebody say you're just blessed to be sitting next to me say I can't help it say you're just blessed I can tell you must be God's favorite and so when he says let us make man he said that, that, that um, let it, he said in our image and he created a help meet help me means help meet means one who will surround one who will aid and one who will protect one who will stand boldly in front of and so we begin to study that extensively what our bonding needs are how we get to adult attachment why do we choose the people that we choose what are the different stages and cycles of relationship because we found out if we go from stage one to stage five we can't can't get back that intimacy part all the different dynamics and last week we begin to teach on the gender differences so let's pick up there and get more into it we found out that love is four things number one it is a feeling that you experience how many of you have ever felt love you felt love that feeling's a great feeling isn't it but we so only three people think that feeling's good the problem is you can get stuck on the feeling of love. You can get stuck in the infatuation process and never get to that deeper adult attachment. And you can fall in love with being in love, which means you can be a serial repeat with relationships. And God wants you to get to that whole place, that healthy place. But love is a feeling. And, and you might say, well, it's not important. I live by faith. Oh, feelings are very important. God's the one that created you. He created you with feelings. And while feelings are not the main part of you, they're like the indicator lights on the engines and so while the engine is the main thing that gives you power your spirit is the engine lights kind of tell you where you are they help you locate so if you get in your car and you're low on gas or the oil is about to go out you know the engine will burn out without oil so some of you need some oil today some of you need some fresh oil and that's why you got touched by the Holy Spirit and why God said I'm going to restore to you joy because he knew that you needed oil and, and sometimes life has a way of just depleting us and so feel help us maneuver and find and locate where we are you are a spirit soul and body love number two is an attitude and love wants the best for the one that is loved we, we studied first Corinthians chapter 13 it describes God kind of love that it endures long means it stands firm under pressure it's not jealous it, it's not envious of another person or prefers one over the other it's not boastful it's not haughty it's not rude it doesn't talk down it, it's not self-seeking or self 
selfish. It's not resentful. It bears up under anything and everything, which means it covers the scandal. And most of all, love never fails. Thank God that love never fails. If you really build a solid foundation on your, your walk with God, the love of God, and your family, which is built on true love, it will last because foundations determine what will be built. Number three, love is a decision and a commitment that you make every day. Sometimes you will it even though you don't feel it. You don't always feel it, but you will make a decision to practice and to walk out love. And fourth and finally, love is a skill that is cultivated. You know, we teach crazy things. I was a teacher for a long time, no hard to tell that, but I taught seventh grade boys um, Bible and algebra, and then I taught ninth grade, and, and uh, we teach a lot of things. I bet most of the students that I had hardly ever use algebra or were walk out geometry. But if we would have taught them how to balance their checkbook or how to walk in love and how to do some of the basic things that really make us better human beings, more godlike, more true to the character of God in us, I think it would advance us a lot farther. Not that I don't believe in algebra and geometry, but not at the expense of you not having the fundamentals to practice the life skills. So I'm grateful to be able to teach this through the Word of God because if your relationships don't work, as Minister Norm said, the, to a great degree, then life is not working. So we want life to work, don't we? Because God gave his only son that whosoever believed on him would not only perish, but he came to give him life and life more abundantly. So he came to rescue you, but he also came to give you life and that you would have one that is superior. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 13 and 14, the person who does not love is spiritually dead. Wow, that's a big one to handle, right? So it says, if I don't love, then I am spiritually dead. So I can say all the time that I'm alive to Christ and I can make confessions all day, but the true, the true acid test of that is, do I have the love of God operating in my life? Do I I love and, and relationships are the place that we practice the love of God. It's the place that you practice because no one wakes up perfected. In fact, when your love is perfected, it casts out all fear. You come to that perfect place of faith, which means it is a constant work in your life. How many of you want God to do a deeper work? Come on, how many of you want to perfect your love? That means come to a place of maturity. Well, you have to practice it. You have to perfect it. And that's a decision that you make every day. So I want you to write something down really big big. Decision means, um, to, the etymology of decision is from the root of to cut away. So whatever is harming your relationships, I want you to cut it away. I want you to make a decision to perfect or to complete love in your relationships. I want you to make a decision to be committed to love. I want you to make a decision, God make me a more loving person. That might include forgiveness, that might include whatever it is that God needs to do. But, but it, it's saying, God, use me because the marriage in the home is a divine sacred institute of God. It's a mini model of the church. And it's where God uses for you to develop and practice the character of Christ. Because that is the place where you should be naked and unashamed. That's the place that you see the true person. Come on. You see all the flaws, all the faults, everything. And God says, love like I love. Woo, that's a deep, that's a deep thing he's asking us. Well, Dr. Harley identified the top 10 needs in our life. And he's a great Christian psychiatrist. And he said, number Number one is admiration for men and respect. A number one for women is affection. And these aren't necessarily in order. They're just the 10 needs. Conversation, domestic support. Number five, family commitment. Number six, financial support. Number seven, honesty and openness. Physical attractiveness, recreational companionship, and sexual fulfillment. You are going to go there, Pastor Paula. Let's talk about... All right, this side's got it down. So you say, really meet the needs... But you see, needs are important. God created you with needs. I know that you want to say, I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. Well, the devil is a liar. You do have needs. And we, we need each other. God created us for community. We need each other. And let me tell you something about needs for a minute. Because as I was worshiping, the Lord just said, drop this in on this, this service. He took me over to Hosea and Gomer. And I was reminded that desperate people do desperate things. 
And the reason that we get desperate is because needs are denied in our life. When we don't take care of our needs, you can love God with all your heart. You, you can want to serve God with all your being. But that need is such a strong drive in you that God created certain, certain institutions to meet your needs. That's why I said last week, when you, make, when you get married, you shouldn't enter in marriage unadvisably or lightly. It's holy before God. So you're not just making a promise and a commitment and a covenant to that person. You're you're making it to God because if you don't meet the needs of that person which the Bible very clearly tells you to do then you're leaving a doorway of access for them to enter into unethical behavior which you promised to meet good good teaching pastor Paula good teaching and so we stand before the Lord and we have to be accountable that's why he talks so much about it and he used the illustration of marriage like our relationship with God and the intimacy that he wants but you look at you look at Gomer her name and Jose's name her name is beloved and Jose's name means salvation and God says to Jose salvation he says go down to the whoredoms and get yourself a wife go marry a whore and so he pulls her out and she comes out of that situation brings her in cleans her up has a couple kids with her gets her all doing good and guess what even though she's living in a palace she still has an unmet need in her life even though she now has this all the surroundings around her she still has something on the inside how do you know that because she gets up and leaves her place and she goes back and returns to the auction block and puts herself back up for sale because you go how could a person do that so you can't make a judgment over someone and don't try to pick the speck out of their eyes when you've got a pole protruding from your own because desperate people do desperate things and there's no one especially no woman or no man that wants to derail their destiny nobody wants to mess up their life but how many of us know we can make one decision and totally mess up our life because of that need so needs are important you can't act like I'm just so spiritual I don't have any needs no you've got to understand these are my propensities these are my weaknesses these are my strengths and this is what God needs to do in my life and so all of us have needs somebody say amen somebody let me help you out here the first thing that we we're going to look at is to know and appreciate respect the differences you'll have to get that the second thing we looked at is um, that we, we went into some of those differences. Men sight simulated, women intuitive, men are hunters, they conquer. Uh, we talked all through that. Um, I, I had to clarify when I said men are a little brain damaged. <laughs> So what I meant by that is that the left side of their brain is, or, is, or their brain's washed in testosterone on the left side when they're in the mother's womb, and it causes that neurons not to fire as fast, which means that they don't go from right brain to left brain as fast as women do. So they're usually logical than emotional, where we can be both at the same time because of high internet speed. And so we went through all the different things about talking, about touching, et cetera, and that brought us up to this. And I hope I'll get into the men's, but I'll probably end up doing that on Thursday. What she needs she needs unconditional love to secure her every woman needs to be secured so when you start looking at needs of affirmation needs of attention needs of affection all these things it's all doing the same thing secure me provide me a safe place every woman needs to be secure and there's nothing that can secure a woman more than a man who walks in proper authority a man who walks there's something about even a man's voice there's something about a man's presence that just secures her men let me let you uh, in on something she loves all the fancy stuff you buy her but at the end of the day if she really loves you she'll go out in a trailer with you I mean it's not the fancy things it's that you secure her you make her feel like a woman you make her feel safe is that okay I'm preaching today you make her feel safe you make her feel like okay I've got you babe I've got your back because unplanned changes have a way of catching up with a woman why because all change feels like loss so you can change and even change to something better I'll never forget when we moved from San Pedro which was about a 900 square foot house and we moved uh, uh, he moved me into a 4,000 about 800 square foot house and everyone would think oh that's just great well I sat in that jacuzzi bathtub and cried because I was like it felt awkward to me number one I was struggling with some low self-esteem then I was struggling uh, with rejection still I was struggling like feeling unworthy so I had a hard time receiving the goodness of God and I'm sitting in this nice place and the nice place didn't make me feel any better because putting a big diamond on my finger doesn't solve the deeper root that is going on in my life 
putting me in a fancy car doesn't make me feel like more of a woman or make me feel more whole those things are just external it was something that needed to be done internally on the inside of me and you holding me would do a lot more than you putting a big old rock on my finger I and mean, you go well I want the rock too I don't mind the rock don't get me wrong I don't mind the rock but I also like to know I'm secured everything's going to be okay just don't throw things at me give you to me let me know that no matter what because deep inside we all have this this thing in us that have seen too much in life whether it was through our parents or our grandparents or our childhood we see things come and we see things go we see people come and we see people go so we want something that's gonna say I'm going to be there for you come hell or high water I secure you we got at least I got one amen in the house so when women don't receive unconditional love she begins to wither she begins to draw up and it's not natural for a woman to be so independent and so on her own some of us have been forced to be but that's not her nature her nature is not to be that her nature is to be governed guarded and guided her nature if she has a husband it's a house band he is to band the house together and it means he cares for that house he secures that house she doesn't mind that she makes more money or she has more education she just wants to know if she can't do it will you step up to the plate and do it will you be the man so so no matter what you're going through encourage your wife when she fails or disappoints you which she will uh, your first response give her the ability to fold or to rise above and say things to her like I'll never leave you I'll never turn my back on you I don't care what what just happened I'm here for you in other words separate the behavior or the situation from her the power of unconditional love and acceptance during a time of hardship can heal a woman's wounded heart provide her with permanence and safety stand with her because every woman struggles with insecurity all women the most beautiful women the most intelligent because women measure themselves up to other women we compare ourselves now you don't see men do this I hit this a little bit but women measure their worth to other women it's just the way that we are so men don't usually compare themselves to other men and except for one two for ten time but anyway <laughs> so men you they aren't like this women though measure themselves so we we look to ourselves that's why you never see in the word notice something even though Though there's a father and succession in the word the only time the word directs is towards women it says the older women teach you younger women because it's saying godly holy women rise up to the occasion and in part because women measure their worth by other women we mirror to each other it's how that God created us and so notice how women do if, if we're all sitting at a table or something and somebody's got to go to the bathroom women say I gotta go to the bathroom you gotta go to the bathroom yeah come on and we all go to the bathroom together it's like a bathroom party notice that do you ever see men go I gotta go to the bathroom you want to go too uh-uh if he does that something's wrong he doesn't do that in fact a man will be like I gotta go to the bathroom and the guy's about to hold himself about to wet himself everywhere because he will hold that all night long before he gets up and goes to the bathroom with that other guy but women don't you wonder what we do in there guys I mean we're we like have potty parties come on girls and 30 minutes later we return like what could you have been doing man we've exchanged numbers we talked about the latest shopping trip we talked about the food we did this we tried on each other's shoes we bought each other's lipstick you would be shocked what goes down in the bathroom help me ladies so women have needs for attention and undivided attention you have to give it to her not all the time but on occasionally let her know she is your primary importance compliment her because you receive by sight now this is important ladies because how does he receive by what okay I'm gonna hit this for a minute can make sure y'all paying attention that we have an active engagement he receives how by sight so when you are doing for him it translates that you love him so that's why when you're cooking biscuits he comes up and slaps you on the butt and gives you that little woo because you're just saying to him I love you and he's like oh my baby loves me because he sees you doing for him and so he receives by sight correct now you receive by hearing so you don't care that he's fixing the car for you I mean that's not like you don't go up and slap him on his butt and go oh you fixing the car for me 
No, you receive by him telling you, you're so beautiful. I love you. You receive by hearing, but he receives by sight. So knowing that, take care of yourself. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. I'm just going to take care of yourself. He's been around perfume all day. Come on, he's been around somebody that's got a new weave in, doesn't have one that's like eight months old. And you come home and you've got the baby diaper over here and you've got bunny slippers on and you've got your hair in rollers and there's a little bit of spinach still in your teeth from your sandwich today. And you'd be like, hey, honey. He's like, oh, Lord, have mercy. I mean, don't get... Think what message you are sending him because you fix yourself up to go to church. You fix yourself up to go to work. Why don't you fix yourself up to go to him? Because you're saying to him, church is more important. Work is more important, but you're not important. He's the most important thing. That's your main ministry if you're married. Oh, pastor's going to teach it anyhow. Fix yourself up for him. Take care of him. Take care of yourself. I, I studied under a rabbi one time, and he said, you know, Paul, he said, men are sight stimulating. He said, God created women to be a mystery because man can never completely figure out woman. That's because we can't figure ourselves out. So he can never completely figure out. She's a mystery. She's a wombed man. And so he said, when you, when you are in the shower, he said, don't have a clear shower curtain. He said, have one that's a little bit sheer that you can see through because he's got to hunt, he's got to conquer, he's got to build her on the inside side of him and he always wants to chase you down leave a little bit of mystique don't show everything there's some wisdom in that you don't you you leave a little because he is sight stimulated good teaching right here so men spell intimacy how guys how do men spell s e x all right women spell intimacy how t a l k we got some challenges <laughs> So most men hear intimacy and they think passionate, physical experience. Your wife hears intimacy, she thinks good, emotional connection, communication. So men, your sex drive is connected to your eyes. You become very visually aroused. But women's sex drive is connected to her love tank. She's aroused by, after she feels emotional closeness and harmony. So men compartmentalize everything in their life. They have boxes. Women see everything connected to everything else. And so when I say that he has boxes box number one work box number two family box number three hobbies box number four church women are totally different she has those same boxes but she has an emotional thread that runs through hers so in other words her boxes are connected so if something's going wrong with the kids it affects her on the job if something went wrong with the job it affects her with her husband so she's all connected to those so sometimes men you just have to pray for patience that God will give you an ability to love her even when she can't locate herself she'll figure it out because she's a processor so when one box is affected it has a chain effect so a woman's life events are carefully threaded together for a woman emotional intimacy doesn't come when one person gives in and finally agrees now why is this important because men are conquerors so for a man he's a winner right men like to win amen you don't get on a football field just to play do you you play to win you don't get in a boxing ring just to fight. You play to win. It's about winning. If you're going to do something, you're going to win at it. Now, women are the exact opposite. For a woman, they are not. Some of us can be highly competitive and, and have different, but a woman's nature at the true essence is not about winning. She just wants to be heard. She wants to be understood. In other words, I don't have to win this argument. I just need to be heard. I just want to be validated and valued. I want to know that I'm not invisible to you that you notice me that you hear me the worst thing she can do is go get a haircut and you say what haircut I mean she changed her hair three different colors and you don't even notice notice and she and she, women can be can be slippery like this they're always trying to test you out try to stop trying to test him out and just be straight up and help a brother out say do you do you like this new color three shades different I mean don't make him be a mind reader so so she needs to be validated, understood, and listened. She needs to experience emotional closeness. She needs to feel listened to and understood. She has to feel like she's at the top of your account. She needs undivided attention. See, not all of you want to be husbands now. Y'all are like, man, I'm going to keep praying for a good thing. I'm going to wait. I didn't know it was all this work. <laughs> 
She, she needs you to demonstrate respect for her. And she's got to feel a cut above everybody else. Let me tell you about something in a marriage. Every woman does not want to be princess. They want to be queen. They, they want to be queen. So they, they already know you're going to have other things on your court. They know that. You've got your sports. You've got your friends. You've got your work. You've got your goals. You've got your dreams. But at the end of the day, she's like, you can forfeit all that because I better know that I am queen. I'm queen. And she has to know. She really doesn't mind you having all your other stuff on the court. She's just got to know she's number one. That, that everything you're doing has some kind of positive impact towards her life. That she's valuable. If not, she begins to withdraw. She puts up a wall. And anytime walls are put up, you can usually see it. Because the first place it's going to manifest is where, guys? In the where? What room does it manifest in? In the bedroom, right? So we got some, why don't anybody want to talk about it? But everybody wants more of two things. Y'all saying, I want more of the anointing. You all want more money and you want more sex. Come on, you, you know that you do. That's the way that God created you. I got three people to say amen on that one. Pastor Edwards, you need to go into deep intercession right now. So, so here, here's this. She needs number one need to a woman. Number one need. And this is generalized because I've already covered the specifics that you've got to know the person you're with, right? You've got to know them individually. But the number one need for most women is affection and attention. Affection, attention, conversations right behind that. So that his number one need is admiration and respect. His number two need is sexual fulfillment. That's a, Dr. Hurley starts putting these in order as we start studying. So what is affection? Affection is tender attachment. It is a moderate feeling of emotion. So affection rates is one of the top needs because women symbolize affection as security, protection, comfort, approval, vitality, and important commodities from their husband. When a husband shows affection, he sends the following message. Messages. I'll take care of you and protect you. You are important to me and I don't want anything to happen to you. I'm concerned about the problems you face. I'm proud of you. You did a great job. One hug from that significant man in your life can make all the problems just melt away. One hug. That's why in therapy and in counseling, they talk about the, really the ministry of touch. That one hug can change everything. And it's not like men just by nature go around hugging everybody. I just hug you all the time. But if you'll learn just to take your wife and hold her for a moment, just to hold her for a few seconds, it can change the course of everything. So a hug can say all the above. And men need to understand how strongly women need these affirmations. Well, I'm not giving her that. I don't. She's not one of your guys. She is a woman. She has a need. Now, we're going to get to the needs of men. But I know you want more of what you want, right? You want to be respected. It's your house. And daggone it, I'm going to get respect. This is my house. You're not going to talk to me like that. The worst thing you never do is emasculate a man. Is talk down to him or talk bad about him in front of someone else. Worst thing you never do. Because a man will give you his body all day long. But if he gives you his heart, you better protect it. And so you value that and protect it. Well, you want respect. She needs affection. Just like you say, well, uh, you aren't saying, hey, you're like, this is what I need. You've got to remember these are her top needs. And so she needs a hug. What are some of the ways we show affection? A hug. Something like send her flowers when it's not a special occasion. Invite her out to dinner. Take her out on a date. Write her that greeting card. Express your emotions the best you can. Um, randomly call her and just tell her, say, I love you. Give her a kiss before you leave in the morning. Kiss her every single night and hold her tight and say, baby, I've got you. Just give her a sweet little kiss. It doesn't have to be a sexual one. Just give her a little peck on the lips and just say, baby, I've got you. Next to affection, conversation is one of the most important needs to a woman. In conclusion, you show interest after the honeymoon and you keep communication strong. Women feel understand when men listen to feeling. Men feel understood when women listen to ideas. So she wants you to understand how she feels. Which, by the way, men need to be heard as well. But respect her opinion. Pay attention to her. Don't minimize how important your role is. And here's how you have great communication. Can I give you about three points? Can I give you about three points? Now, these are good for anything. Whether it's in a relationship, a marriage, whether it's on your job. If you get this down, because all of life really comes down to your ability to communicate. They say that the number um, two problems, the reasons for divorce are what? Sex and money, correct? Top two reasons for divorce. But is money really a money problem? It's a communication problem. Is sex really a sex problem? 
It's a communication problem. So if we fix the communication thing, then we can fix a lot of the other things. Because often, it's like this. Guys, some of you are in relationship and you don't even know how to communicate your needs. You don't like the way he kisses you. You haven't liked it for 10 years. But he don't know any different. He thinks he's Casanova. And you sitting there going, if he bites my lip like that again. You've got to talk to him. You've got to be able to communicate. Oh, this is good teaching anyhow. So what does great communication start with? By being a great what? Listener. So if you're going to be a great communicator, you have to be a ready listener. Do not answer until the other person has finished talking. That means you have to suspend your thoughts. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 13. It says, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. What does it say, guys? To answer before listening, that is what? Folly and shame. Now, how many honest people am I going to have? How many of you have ever been in a conversation with somebody important to you and you've interrupted them? All right? And the Bible says it's our folly and our shame. So it's like, just shut it up. Do that. What, what was that? Uh, I know I shouldn't confess that I watched this movie. What was that? Um, zip it. Zip it. What was that? Austin Powers? Zip it. You're doing this, and I want you to do this. I guess nobody else ever saw Austin Powers. I'm the only crazy. You know, y'all, why are you all acting like you never watch any movie except for going to the cross? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Edward Cassie's lying demons out. I was just having a challenge this morning. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. You're doing this right now, and I need you to do this. In other words, just suspend it, like be quiet, which means if I'm going to be quiet, I've got to be non-judgmental. I've got to be a witness to the conversation and not a judge to the conversation. Uh, the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So a good listener becomes a witness and not a judge of the experience. At the heart of a good listener, they suspend their own needs. There's a big difference between showing interest and really taking interest. So if you're a good listener, Ali, you've got to actively engage. I used the 9 o'clock this morning. This is not the easiest teaching to do because it can get monotonous, right? So every once in a while I have to break it up with a story or come down or actively engage you. That's why we're going to get out in two minutes. Because I couldn't go 30 more minutes and keep you held captive in an audience. You can't do that because there's too much information to get you to actively engage. So you have to break it up. The teaching has to be bro broken up. So when we actively engage, you're paying attention to body language. You suspend. You're, you're present in that moment. You zone into that person. There's not 50 other things. You aren't answering your phone. You aren't watching the game. You aren't going around them. You actively engage. It's not about you. You're not thinking about your response. You're suspending your own thoughts. You are actively engaged. Then once you hear that and you actively engage, you parrot that conversation. You say back to that person what they just said to you. Uh, Minister Norm, who's got, some, who's got some change? Somebody give me some pocket change. One of the men got some pocket change. Bruce, somebody. I need a man and a woman up here real quick. Somebody run up here. Get me a couple up here. Come on, guys. Come on up, pastors. Come on up. Let me show you something. All right. So somebody got some pocket change. I all knew Destiny's not broke. Come on up. Come on up, guys. Somebody bring me some pocket change. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, you come on up here. Come on up here, Tanya. Come on up. Let me show you something. All right, Pastor. Come here. Come on, guys. I'm gonna have to use the floor as my example. All right. What do you see, Pastor? Change money. Change money. What do you see? Money on the floor. Money. 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 Okay. Anybody else? What do you see? Dimes, quarters, pennies. Come on up here, Sonia. You're always so good. Get up here. Come, come up here. So you see dimes, quarters, pennies. Who else? Who else? Anybody else? Y'all don't see nothing? I mean, if I put... Huh? You see a mess? Okay, she's seen a mess. Come on up here. I'm going to show you something. Anybody else? What do you see? Money to buy yourself something. All right, now look here. You've got a couple here, and this is the number one thing you'll do in counseling with everything. So you've got a couple, and you guys happen to see the same thing. That's very unusual if you're sitting with people. Well, you see dimes, quarters, nickels. What do you see? It's a mess. You see a mess. All right, you see out of place. You see disorder. She's OCD, and she? 
I guess she's so, so everything's got to be organized in the house. So if you mess up those closets or those uh, pantry, uh, I'll you in trouble. All right, here's why. Some people, and if I just use a little bit of change here, maybe they just see this. If I drop this, they'd say, I see 51 cents. Or like Sonia said, I see quarters, I see dimes, I see nickels. Now, someone else might see, I see money. They're all looking at the same thing, right? But they see it differently. So when I'm, when I'm listening, I'm going to say, you see money. Now, I might be looking and go, I see 51 cents. But I'm not there to convince you that this is 51 cents. I'm there to understand you. So I'm trying to understand, how do you see money out of this when I see 51 cents? So that's just something small. But let's take our children or how we raise children or let's take how we worship God or bring in the tithe in the storehouse. I see that if you don't bring the tithe, you bring our house under a curse. You might see if I bring the tithe, I, I'm, I'm bankrupting our household. We're, we're, doing, we're looking at the same thing, but we're seeing it from a different perspective, which can cause a huge rift in this family. So my job is not to convince you that I'm looking at 51 cents. My job is to understand how you label this money. So I want to understand what does money mean to you. So you saw money, what does money mean to you? Oh, see, we're doing a live counseling service right here. It's raining, so y'all don't have anything else to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. What does money mean to you? Okay. To her, money, whoo, praise the Lord. Money means access. To him, money means provision, right? What does money mean to you? Taking care of the needs of your family. Control. You see how we've got the same thing, but it has a different meaning to everybody? So let's go in and find out why. You want to find out why it means that? What's your earliest memory of money? Well, we didn't have when I was growing up. They didn't have when they were growing up. But when I got in a relationship, it was a means to control me. But when she got in a relationship, it was a means to control her. Okay? What's your earliest memory of money? Uh, probably being in the bank with Grandma. Being in the bank with Grandma. And what did money mean to you? She she was a access. Saver. Yeah, yeah. And she was a saver. Okay? Money means to her access, her earliest memory. What's your earliest memory? Um, being able to provide and do things that I'm not able to do when I'm being a wise steward. Being able to provide and do things that he wasn't able to do. So what did money mean to him? Provision. What's your earliest memory? My mom just being able to take care of them. What's her earliest memory? Her mom being able to take care of them financially. What did money mean to her? being able to provide for others that she loved and take care of them. You see how everything has a root to it? So how they see it, if I'm sitting here in a relationship and I'm trying to convince you, this is 51 cents. It's not money. This is 51 cents. But I'm not understanding you that money means access, that money means provision, that money means control. So right here, you two, if y'all, I mean, if that was a different, say that was a husband and this one, you, the money meant control to you and your husband, then y'all would be clashing because you're looking at the same thing, but you have two totally different reasons, two different roots for it. So my job is not to convince you that money is 51 cents. My job is to understand you. Why do you see it as access? Why do you see it as provision? Why do you see it as control? Because the reality is we're all looking at the same thing. We're all looking at the same thing, but we see it different. And so if I want to make this relationship work, then I have to get empathetic. And so as a good husband, it is my job as authority to understand where she is coming from. Did you get anything out of today? Yeah, I'm giving you money back, sir. Thank you, guys. Come on here. You didn't have the money back. Here you go. And there's even 21 cents interest on it. There was 21 cents up here. See? Just for using your money. God bless you. Did you get anything out of today's teaching? So all y'all going to be going home, throwing your coins out and say, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Because you've got to understand our biggest problems are we don't know how to communicate. And if we can break down that barrier and understand another person, let's take out, let's take out there's no such thing as right or wrong. There's no such thing as good or bad. It's just a matter of understanding you. And if I can understand you, then I can ask God to give me a grace to walk in life with you. 